Hi everyone, this is Isaac Steinkamp from the Chess Summit Network. And for today I decided to try a live chess video again, see how this goes. Um, it's been a while since I've made my last video, and I apologize again for the wait, but hopefully this summer I can have more videos up my channel as I graduate high school tomorrow. Woo, class 2015, looking to be a Pit Panther next year. Um, so for today's game, I'm looking at a G15 game in the ICC pool. And I'm hoping that I can use this game to help me prepare for the World Open. Um, this summer I'll be competing in the U2200 section in Arlington, Crystal City. And I'm actually going with a couple of friends. So it's going to be a lot of fun um, playing in the five-day section because uh, I like these longer time controls. So um, I, guess, I guess we'll really see how that goes. And um, you know, I don't know how many students are out there watching uh, my games in terms of like uh, Scholastic players. But I've always found that the summer is my best chance to improve my game. And usually from about July to November or so, that's my biggest rating gain of the whole year. So I'm really looking forward to this year. And hopefully um, it will translate into a lot of success going into next school year. So here I am with my G15 game. I'm playing someone who's about 1,600. Um, but I guess you have to be careful with that on ICC because 1,600 is to start out rating on G15. So... Um, I'll pretend like this person's a grandmaster and uh, really calculate here. So I've been seeing this knight f3 move a lot after d4. It's starting to become more and more common instead of the typical c4. And I guess the thing I like about this move is it's very flexible. My opponent can choose to play a London system with bishop to f4. They can also go into c4, e3 structures very nicely, especially if I were to play e6. That, that's a very good Nimzo structure for them, but also it gets into some nice Fianchetto positions after c4 white can play for g3 kind of like a Catalan or a Fianchetto Kings Indian So You know, I'm playing black. I'm going to make the least committal move g6. This is you know a favorite line of mine and um, We'll see how it goes. I mean usually it turns into a Kings Indian white just plays c4 but Whoa, yeah, usually when you see this move knight to f3 bishop f4 You know becomes more likely because that's a typical London setup, but this knight h4 move violates a whole bunch of opening principles here. Um, this this can't be good. Um, so, okay, so how do you exploit a move like this? Well, you know, in a tournament, you always you know you always want to be looking out for the attacking edge, but there's really no way to immediately punish this knight on h4. So I, the way I look at this move is there's a couple of ways that I can treat this move. A, it's a loss of tempo. You know, this is a move that White now can't develop, and at some point, this knight will have to move away from h4. Um, you know, if you've watched my video on how to optimize pieces, the goal is to move the piece the fewest amount of times, so that way it's the most active later. In this case, knight on h4 can't really do anything as the g6 pawn covers f5. So at some point, this knight will have to move again. So, you know, at the very least, white's going to lose time on the board in terms of number of moves. Meanwhile, I kind of get to play white here. So I'm just going to complete my fianchetto, play bishop to g7, and kind of see what my opponent does. I really can't create a whole plan yet. I mean, I'm probably still going to go for that d6 idea, maybe c5 or e5, perhaps castle kingside. I mean, the, this knight's so awkwardly placed, there's not, not even a practical kingside pawn storm. I'm really curious to see what my opponent does. And Okay, well, this is just a free knight. And that cannot be good. Um, I guess we'll see what my opponent's follow-up is here. But... Yeah, definitely violating a whole lot of opening principles, uh, obviously hanging a piece, perhaps my opponent. This is their first game or so. But okay, let's see what we can do here. Um, whenever you see pawns like this, when they're a, kind of like a file apart and there's no pawn protecting the central square, this is a great outpost. So I think the move to make here is just to play knight to e4. And if my opponent plays this move knight to c3, you know, I can take and create doubled pawns. And then I have a fair amount of control over the center. And if my opponent does nothing, moves like e5, threatening queen h4 checkmate, and the e pawn attacking both the f and the d pawn seems pretty devastating to me. Um, yeah, this cannot be a good position at all. In fact, after knight to e4, knight to c3, I can just play this move d4. And I think if knight takes e4, do I have any sack potential for queen h4? No, not really, because of knight f2. But I can take, and if my opponent takes my e5 pawn, I can still play queen to h4 check with some counterplay. Um, but obviously, the more safe way is to just play knight takes c3, and I'm just better. So, okay, here I'm going to grab my outpost. Knight to e4, and if my opponent doesn't attack this knight immediately, let's say plays a move like um, bishop d2, c4, e3, I think I'm just going to play a pawn sacrifice, e5, attack the center and threaten checkmate, 
Um, in this case, would just happen to be a very good case too. Um, g4 obviously isn't doing too much, so I'm just going to play this move e5. If my opponent plays, uh, if my opponent plays g5, it's a free d4 pawn. So even if it blocks in my queen, I'm not too worried. Uh, and checkmate is around the corner. Do I get my first checkmate in seven on a live chess video? How about eight? Um, king to f1 is now forced. Queen to f2. So I'll have another live chess uh, game after this, uh, uh, of course. Um, but you know, even in this game, which was rather short, you know, we learned a you know a bunch of things. You know, obviously, don't waste a bunch of time. You know, in the opening with these moves like knight h4, knight f5. But you know, we got to see the practical application of an outpost in the center when when your opponent plays um, pawns that are you know a file apart and there's a square in the middle. And that's actually a very common idea that's used in the Morosi bind. So um, let's let's launch up another g15 game. Let's see what kind of competition I get. Um, but as I was saying before the game, you know, the summer, especially for, you know, high school, middle school students, it's the best time to really improve your tournament play. So for the, me this summer, uh, after the World Open, I'm doing a chess camp at my school. And then I, um, I won't play this guy again. Then I'll play in the Charlottesville Open. It's a two-day tournament, G90 or G120 time controls. I've got a DC Chess League match in there somewhere. And then I have the Potomac Open and the Washington International, both in Rockville, Maryland. Um, so I'm really excited about that send-off. Um, five tournaments in one summer is definitely a lot, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and it's probably going to be one of my most busy chess summers ever, so I guess we'll really see how it goes. So definitely a longer break on the ICC room. Here we go. Here's another game. Usually I get games a little bit faster than this, but here we are, another 1600. Let's see how this goes. So I'm going to play the English. And he goes for the symmetrical. So the idea is when you're playing someone lower rated, it's okay to play solid. Just make sure that you have a lot of plans and there's a lot of strategy behind your position. So I'm going to play g3 here. Um, not the typical move order, but it usually doesn't matter. Usually white likes to play knight c3 first, but I like to wait a couple moves just to kind of throw my opponent off. But in the symmetrical, I mean move order is really not that important. So here I'm going to play knight to c3. My opponent will probably copy my position, bishop to g7. And let's throw in the first wrinkle, d4, kind of playing it like a Morozzi style. If he takes, c takes d, I'll just play knight takes d4. And then already I have a lot of pressure on the, on c6. I had a game like this in Nationals, I actually botched the opening, but the, the things I like about this kind of position is it's really easy to create pressure in the center, especially if you can get this d6 pawn or e6, e7 pawn to be really weak. And black can't play it like a true Morozzi as long as white doesn't play this e4 move, which is uh, the mistake I made at Nationals. So here I'll just castle, and so my opponent plays a5. So this is a very typical Morozzi idea, but I believe in this case I might be able to mix it up a little bit, kind of like in that first game I just showed where the, where the opponent had pawns on c4 and e4 in the d4 square this week. In this case, I think it's the same with the b5 square. Rather than trading knight takes c6 or letting my opponent play knight takes d4 to uncramp his position, I think this knight on d to b5 move could actually be fairly annoying, especially if I pair it with moves maybe like, no, not not so much bishop to f4. Um, uh, I don't accept takebacks on ICC. I mean, this is not an obvious blunder. Um, so, okay. As I was saying, uh, the dark square has become really weak for black, and it's not quite clear how he'll use the position. Meanwhile, you know, the c3 knight's, you know, backed up by the b5 knight, so this diagonal automatically becomes a lot weaker for the dark squared bishop. So here... You know, I don't usually play this move, but it seems very promising. I'm going to try this move, knight db5. And, you know, what are my ideas here, you know, beyond using this outpost? Well, probably my first thing I want to figure out is how do I want to use the c1 bishop? You know, if I can get it onto h6 and trade for the, um... Wow, he resigned. Um, I mean, perhaps he booked up on the position, but okay, as I was saying, this, this bishop on c1... You know, there, there's really not too many squares for it. You know, if I go to e3, I run the risk of knight to g4. I could play bishop to g5, but, um, you know, that's a little bit committal. You know, that's probably the option I'd go for. But, you know, ideally, bishop d2, queen c1, maybe bishop g5, queen c1, and then play for bishop to h6. It's really hard for black in these kinds of positions to play without a dark squared bishop. You'll notice that black's, you know, traditional play in the Morozzi is like d6, knight d7. And to use this dark squared bishop, but without the dark squared bishop, this knight d7 plan doesn't really work out. All right, so let's go to third game. Maybe third time's a charm for a longer game. I've had two games across 16 moves. 
So, well, you know, uh, I haven't been updating my blog too much on chesssummit.wordpress.com. Uh, and that's one thing I definitely hope to be doing this summer. But in terms of my goals, you know, I'm really looking to try to push for that 2100, maybe candidate master. Okay, so we've been another D4 game. This time my opponent's 1700. So clearly he's played a bunch of games in ICC. Um, and we'll see how this one goes. Let's see if they go for that knight f3 move order or f4. Okay, so f4 is definitely unorthodox, but it's not a bad move, actually. Um, my opponent can opt for e3 and try to play it like a, um, a, a reverse stone wall, which is probably what he'll go for in this kind of situation, 9 times out of 10. You'll usually see moves like e3, bishop d3 first, um, but there's no immediate way to exploit this f4 move. Maybe, maybe this knight e5, uh, e4 idea at some point, but let's put that on the shelf for right now. Another idea perhaps is to play e4 and then c3, but without a knight protecting the e4 square, it seems very difficult. Okay, so for me, what are my options? Well, I can play d5 and immediately push to play for this e4 square, but the problem is by doing so, I actually create a weakness on e5 for a little bit. In some stonewall positions, that can be a little bit unfavorable. I can play d6 with the plan of playing e5 myself, um, the problem is for my opponent that he has no easy way of playing for the e4 square. Um, but, I mean, this is a move order difference. I mean, this is not the typical move order. So, if I play d6, my opponent can play knight to c3, and now he can play for e4. And it becomes kind of like a weird perk line where white doesn't have a pawn on c4. Um, meanwhile, if I, were to, if I were to play knight e4 first, if he plays knight c3, I can go ahead and double his pawns, kind of like that first game. He doesn't really have another way of challenging my knight. I mean, he could play like queen d3, but now d5 might actually make sense because I can follow it up with bishop to f5 and put a lot of pressure on the position. So I think I'm going to challenge my opponent. This, this, um, These three games seem to be all about finding these outposts in the position. My opponent plays knight to f3, so okay. So I've reached a position where I'm not, you know, 100% familiar with. I'm just kind of playing off of intuition here. So what I, what can I do? Well, I can kind of match him a little bit. I can play like a Leningrad style Dutch perhaps, maybe with f5, g6, bishop g7, d6, or f5, e6, d6, uh, and then kind of play it like a reversed English line. That actually doesn't seem too bad. If I play f5, he plays knight c3, you know, I will have to take, but now he's got doubled pawns. That actually, that actually might be an okay idea. Another option is I can try e6. If I'm playing e6, I haven't really opened up this diagonal to my king yet. And if he plays knight to c3, bishop to b4 could be annoying. Um, he doesn't really have a way to attack this knight yet. I'm I'm imagining that he's probably going to opt for knight to b to d2 though in order to attack this knight. So by playing e6 to play bishop b4, that doesn't really work as well, well I guess, because after knight bd2, bishop b4, he just has c3, and now he gets his typical stonewall play. So, perhaps the best way is to play it like a Leningrad of sorts. Pawn on f5, pawn on d6, g6, play along this diagonal. You know, if he goes through c3, maybe at some point I have a c5 move and I try to bust open the long diagonal. Okay, so so let's give this a whirl. I have no idea what I'm doing in terms of, you know, actual opening preparation, but this, this seems logically sound here. My opponent, you know, is kind of playing it like a, a Dutch himself. So, okay, he played e3, solid move. And do I want to play g6 or do I want to play e6 first? Let's play, let's play g6 first, make sure that everything's kind of locked up and safe, and then play bishop g7, d6, and then go from there. So I'm actually not that much of a Dutch player. I've taught the Stonewall Dutch to uh, one of my students, and I have a couple players who I know who play the Stonewall Dutch, and I work with them to help them improve their, you know, their middle game strategies and whatnot. Um, so I'm kind of just going off of ideas here. The idea behind the, the Stonewall Dutch, let's go from White's perspective. He's going to play c3 at some point and have like this zigzag pawn structure. And the idea is that he's going to make it hard for me to play on the dark squares. Um, by doing this, you know, it'll make things a little bit more uh, challenging for me to find active play. What I want to do is, um, is black is I want to trade down. So this dark squared bishop is just a bad bishop and I have another minor piece against it. And that end game will always favor me. Okay. So this is the first, you know, challenging move that white's made so far, knight bd2. It would be a mistake to play d5 myself, because after knight takes e4, d takes e4, my opponent has this move knight to e5, and now there's no way to kick the knight off of e5. Um, you know, remember, you know, even though my opponent's playing to make it harder for me to play on the dark squares, 
you know, my ideal strategy is perhaps to play bishop g7, d6, and then e5 after castling. And I should have some sort of advantages there. Uh, I mean, obviously, after knight takes d2, my opponent has to waste a tempo and develop. You know, if he plays bishop takes d2, the bishop's not going anywhere. So I have time to play bishop g7. You know, if he moves this knight away from f3, you know, he's he's kind of blocking in his bishop and a queen, and the queen doesn't do anything from d2. So none of the pieces that he can recapture with are truly optimized in this d2 square. So this has to be a good trade for me. This e4 square is still weak, so there's nothing stopping me from playing bishop g7, d6, and then knight d7, knight f6, knight e4 in the near future. Um, but right now, I kind of want to play against this long dark square diagonal. My opponent can get tricky, perhaps, by trying to bring this bishop out. So by playing bishop to g7, this diagonal is not an option. So there's nothing to really be worried about. My opponent might try like for knight g5, h4 stuff here, but I can't imagine this really being too successful. I haven't truly committed my king yet. But now my opponent's trying to deviate from typical Dutch ideas here, which I guess isn't bad, considering that we're not playing a typical Dutch anymore. So bishop to c4 obviously stops me from castling. And um, let's see, what can I do here? Well, you know, I haven't committed myself to kingside castling. So if I were to play this move e6, I have a bunch of weaknesses uh, on the um, g5 and e5 square. It kind of feels a little bit awkward, but he has no true tactics. Um, for example, if I play d6, he plays knight g5, I have this move e6, the, the pawn's protected by the bishop, oh wait a minute, it's not, um, not enough times at least, because two attackers, so I do have to be careful, there is some venom here in this position, um, but my opponent doesn't really have a way to attack, and this bishop doesn't belong here in these kind of like stonewall positions. I imagine at some point my opponent might try for some sort of e4 plan, but then again with the bishop on c4, it's really a lot more difficult to execute this. Let's see. If I play e6, he castles. If I castle, it could be a problem. If I play d6, it could also be an issue. Okay. So, another strategy I can use here is I can play for the queen side b6, bishop b7, knight c6, but I don't really have the two center squares that I'd like. So maybe I need to I need to play e6 here, kind of create a triangle, play d6, b6, bishop b7, knight d7. And then castle queenside. My opponent doesn't really have the flexibility he would want in this kind of position, and he he he's behind. He he his position's awkward enough with these pawns here that he he won't really get the development advantage that he wants. So here I'll just play the move um, e6. You know it's a little bit weakening. Not exactly what I'd hoped for when I started out the game, but it's harder for my opponent to find you know truly active play. And you know I can always play d5 myself at some point whenever I'm ready for it. And, you know, this idea of c5 is still in the still in the cards. In order to do that, though, I'd probably need to play d5, knight d7, c5 myself. Or maybe c5, sack the pawn, and play knight to c6. And let me just play for the dark squares. Okay, so my opponent castles here. And so I think in order for me to really maintain advantage, it's really important that I keep these e4 and d5 squares under my possession. And right now, you know, I only have this one piece developed. I'm not too happy about that. So perhaps I play this move b6. And then play bishop to b7. My opponent doesn't really have a way of stopping this plan. It's safe. You know, I can play knight c6. I can play d6 in the future at some point after like queen e7. Um, maybe even the safer plan is b6, bishop b7, and then d5, and then go for c5. Remember, you know, if I can play along one of these two diagonals, I'm probably a happy camper. So, okay, b6. I've got some sort of weird triangle setup, but my opponent doesn't really have a true stonewall setup either. So I'll be curious to see how my opponent plays here. Maybe for um, queen to e2 with the idea that after bishop b7, if I move my knight away, bishop to a6 could be a little bit annoying, but then that's his good bishop. I mean, even in this position, if I can trade off you know, a pair of minor pieces and that way this dark squared bishop is the last minor piece on the board, he still has a bad endgame, even if he's playing against my dark squared bishop. Okay, he plays rook to b1. Okay, so he's probably going for some sort of Queen pawn storm, or maybe the idea of d5, to and then by rook b1 protects b2, but again, I haven't really committed my king to either side of the board, and now that he's castled kingside, castling kingside for me might not be too bad. Um, but I like to leave that option open, let's just fill up the holes that I have, bishop to b7. And, you know, if my opponent puts all of his pawns on dark squares, he kind of has, has like a Swiss cheese-like position. Okay, bishop to b3. Okay, so he's probably aiming to play this move c4. 
at some point. So, okay, I have a couple strategies. I can play c5, but that's not as strong as I'd like it to be just yet. I could play knight to c6. I could play a5, kind of annoy him, but if he plays c4, then he has enough protectors on the a4 square. Um, so knight c6 is strong. I can play knight to e7, knight to d5, perhaps. Um, d6 still doesn't work. If I castle, I have to play king to h8, and that's kind of a tempo I don't want to spend right now. So knight c6 is looking kind of good here. Um, knight to c6. The question is, how do I really proceed from there? I could play d5. I'm not too crazy about this option, but then that would give me time to go for the e4 square, but then he also gets the e5 square. So I guess the question for me is, is there a way to play this e6 move, um, d6 move rather, but making e6 weak? And that's not quite as clear. So it might actually be a little bit worse in this position, which does not make me happy. I, um... I could play h6 as like a prophylactic measure, but I still need another raw protector of this e6 pawn. Huh. Well, I guess the thing for me is if he plays c4, he's blocking in his bishop and he's trying to reroute it to c2 to play e4. So that's something worth keeping in mind. But I definitely don't want to be passive. I could play d5, keep my knight on d7, and then just hold the position, play c5 with a rook on c8. Maybe the goal is not to get the knight on e4, but rather just stop him from playing e5 and then go for this typical queenside counterplay. Maybe if I can bust open this diagonal, then that's the kind of play that I'll need to try to win this game. With a pawn on d5, I can castle kingside because of the bishop being blunted by the d5 and e6 pawns. Okay, so if I play d5, let's say he plays knight to g5, that's kind of aggressive, attacks e6. Yeah, I guess I'm not that worried. Just queen e7, then knight d7. I can play h6 at some point. I'm fine. All right. So I have to play a little bit quickly here. I only have five and a half minutes. My opponent has a little over 12 and a half. Um, that has more to do with my random rambling, though. Um, if he plays c4 here, I'm not really too worried, I think. Let's see. I could just play c5 and then, well... Okay, well, he played this move. I'll talk about c4 a little bit more in my analysis. The idea is that I'll just put my rook on e8 if he plays c takes d. But there's really no threat here now. I can play queen to e7. And my opponent's going to have to figure out what he wants to do against h6. And this could actually give me time to reroute my knight and um, be happy with the position. Okay, he plays a3 with the idea that if I castle bishop b4, just bishop b4 in general. So... I'll just make a prophylactic move here, a5. The threat's still h6. Um, and I think my opponent's starting to miss the fact of why bishop b3 made sense. Bishop b3 makes sense to play c4, but now with the pawn on a5 and not a7, bishop to a6 looks really attractive for me. Um, it's the one bright thing about playing the light squares diagonal. And this might actually... Well, I don't... This bishop could have more potential at some point than this rook... Um, let's see, do I want to kick the knight first? Because it, if I open up this diagonal too much, this knight's actually doing a good job of covering some of the light squares. Um, if I play h6, he has to react and play knight f3. And that would give me time to play knight d7. If he takes takes, I can castle, put my rook on e8, and just look to put pieces on this e4 square, and it's harder for him to do the same on e5 with both my bishop and my knight pointing there. Uh, and I have the half open file. So, okay, this is this is seeming to be probably the best play. It would be kind of like a weird Morozzi position, actually, where my opponent has pawns on f4 and d4 rather than e4 and c4, but this time I'll also have a weakness to attack on e3. In most Morozzi positions, this file is a half open file where white's the one without the pawn, and black has this weak pawn here, and white's the one who puts all the pressure. But now, it seems to be like the, the stories have switched a little bit. So if I play knight d7, he plays c takes d, I play e takes d. Is there a way that he can attack this pawn on extra time? And it's seeming like the answer there is a resounding no. Um, and this bishop's doing a nice job protecting it, and then this bishop's kind of out of the game. He could play bishop to c2, but then that gives me time to castle. So okay, I'm going to play knight to d7, finish my development. So if my opponent doesn't take here, now it might make sense to play bishop to a6. I would like for my king to be a little bit more safe, though. 
you know, if my opponent plays bishop to a6 in these kinds of positions, I'm really thinking about playing c takes d5, give him the exchange. So c takes d5, bishop takes f1, queen takes f1. Hmm. Okay. So here my opponent's trying to bust open the c file, so that way he can get some potential counterplay. So I could play c6. That kind of blocks on my bishop, but at the same time, I'm, pl I'm probably playing bishop to a6 at some point in the future anyways. If I play c6, he plays c5, I can just play b5, and I'm a happy camper. So c6, if he plays c takes d, I still play e takes d. He has no way of easily attacking c6, as bishop a4 is met with b5, um, and the e5 square is still covered. So I think c6 is the way to go. He has no way of attacking b6. But I'll definitely want to look over this game afterwards. I don't think the Leningrad idea would have been as nice um, as a strategy against his weird move order. Um, but then again, I don't know anything about the Leningrad, so maybe I'm totally wrong about that. Um, so here I suspect my opponent will play c takes d, try to release some of the tension. If he doesn't, I'm probably castling, playing rook on f to e8 or rook on a to c8, uh, and looking for bishop to a6. Moving the rook from f8 to c8 might also not be a bad idea, as the rook on a8 would do a good job of protecting a6 uh, for my bishop. So if the queen were to ever go on d3, bishop a6 is an immediate skewer. Meanwhile, the rook on a8 would also help a pawn push to a4. So on the clock, I've got about 3 minutes and 2 seconds. My opponent just passed 10 minutes and 45 seconds since we're here. Um, and it definitely feels like I made a little bit of progress. I'm definitely still slightly worse. This bishop on b7 is bad. It's not quite clear what this bishop on g7 is going to do. But this it's not like this bishop on b3 or this bishop on d2 are, are good either. The only thing going for him is that this knight is constantly dragging me down by having me to protect this e5 square. Um, so I think the... Wow, he should not have done that. That was a mistake on his part. Um, so he's... Well, let's see. Well, he's going for a pass pawn. Huh. So how do I take back? Well, the thing I don't like about that move is it really weakens his pawn center. And now c5 is actually a serious problem. Because if I take, if he takes with f takes e5, my bishop's pointing at e5, and c5 after a move like rook c8 could actually be really dangerous. Because after a move like d takes c5, this e5 pawn's really weak. After rook takes c5, I've got two attackers. He has no defenders and doubled pawns on the e file. Um, yeah, I don't like this move. And, you know, I still have the natural defender of c6, this bishop. So here, do I want to play rook c8 first? Yeah, I think I play rook c8 first, I castle. There's nothing stopping me from playing c5, because the queen's in front. If the rook were in front and it was like a rook on c2 and a queen on c1, different story. But I think I'm in no rush here. Just rook to c8. He has no way of really being able to push his past pawn, and as long as I can break this diagonal, you know, things are good. If I take one of the bishop, I'm definitely worse. But I might actually have a strategic edge here because of these doubled pawns. This bishop on d1 doesn't really have a role yet. The rook on b1 looks really poorly misplaced. I, I'm starting to guess now my opponent played rook b1, so if I ever opened up this diagonal with a c5 earlier on, b2 isn't hanging, but I wasn't really looking that far. You know, you know, know, I don't really want to weaken my position for two moves to play bishop takes b2. That's just not worth it. Um, so this rook looks misplaced. This bishop doesn't have a role, and the queen's kind of out of place. Now g4... Isn't that a weird move? Do I get to play queen to g5 now? That would be fun. Queen to g5, if he plays h3, he's lost. Um, queen to g5, he has to do something about the pin. That gives me time to play f takes g, g6 pawns protected. Um, that looks good. Um, that looks really good. The only problem is, if I ever play f takes g, um, I can't castle anymore. So that would be a little bit of a bummer. Um... So let's see, queen to g5, king to h1, queen takes g4, rook to g1, queen to h5. And can I get there in time to protect g6? I think I can. King f7 minimally. If not, castle king h7. Um, but I think my opponent's just falling apart here. Let's see, queen to g5. I've got one minute and six seconds, so I'm going to have to make some gut moves here. I spent too much time rambling, but that's okay. I think it's definitely paid off. Minimally, you know... Okay, so if king h1, queen takes g4, rook to g1, minimally I have queen to e4, but 
that might not be necessary now. I think I can just play h5, and now my opponent's just busted. He can't take either way, obviously, because of the pin. And after h takes g4, this file becomes wide open. Okay, my opponent plays e4, but even if he's winning pawns here, his king side's looking really weak. Um, although he does have g takes f5, and that could be a small problem. Let's see, g takes f5, queen to h, uh, queen to g3, check, king to h1, queen takes h3, king g1. Minimally, I have a three mover. Um, but do I ever have bishop takes e5, check is the question. Um, because if I can get that check underway, I can maybe open up this g file. But I think my opponent has to play g takes f. It would at least result in a three mover. Okay, let's, let's set it up. Okay, what do I want to do? Well, I don't want this king to get out too far. So maybe the best thing is to keep the king on h1. I've got 46 seconds. I'll take the three move with five seconds left if I need to here, by the way. Um, so queen g3, king h1. Bishop takes e5, threatening checkmate. D takes e5, stopping checkmate. Um, g takes f5, threatening to bring in the rook. If he ever plays rook g1, queen h3 is checkmate. Okay, so this move is a must be. Um... Problem for me is, oh, my opponent offers me a draw. Let's ignore it for now. Let's see what happens. So if he plays king to h1, I play bishop takes e5, takes, takes, bishop to f4. Can't do that because the bishop on f4 is always going to be too fast. Okay, so if I play queen to h3, as long as he can move that bishop, yeah, it's a three mover. Okay, I'm offering a draw here. So that was exciting. Maybe... I got a little bit too excited there, but let, let's see what happened. Because um, I definitely thought I should have won that game. Okay, let's flip the board. Okay. So, this move order is definitely atypical. I don't... I think knight to e4 might have been premature. Maybe it's just best to stick with the typical main line. But this just seemed too good to, to pass up. Um, f5... Okay, so maybe the problem with g6 is this a little bit loosening on the king side. Maybe it would have made more, more sense to play a move like e6. Um, and that goes into some more standard, whoops, uh, English style play or, you know, I guess classical Dutch style play. I just felt like this was a little bit too slow, but e6 makes a little bit of sense. Knight bd2, I still have to take on g2. And then I play d6, and I have a solid position, knight d7, knight f6. There's nothing stopping me from getting this e4 square. So that was probably the better strategy to go for. I played g6, my opponent traded with me, he had this awkward bishop, and I thought I was better here, but this bishop to c4 move is actually surprisingly annoying. Considering how the game went when I wound up playing d5 anyways, I should have just played d5 here. Um, I, I really don't like this move, because it gives him control of e5, but at the same time, my opponent doesn't really have the development it takes to have some sort of monstrous kingside or central attack. You know, after d5, I have time to play e6 and like d7, and I'm at least equal. But I think the route I took, you know, rook b1 I don't like. You know, it resulted in this kind of structure anyways. But I can't help but feel that white's won with all the, with all the plays here. This move c4. Maybe this move bishop to a6 was something I should have gone for. I thought that maybe my opponent should stick with an exchange stack and he might be better. For example, bishop to a6, c takes d5. Bishop takes f1, um, queen takes f1, and if e takes d5, bishop takes d5, and this rook's kind of misplaced. I didn't like this line. Um, and after c6, bishop f7 check. It was just too much. Um, so I thought kicking this knight, so maybe now would have been the better time to do this. Bishop to a6, and then let's see. So c takes d5. Bishop takes rook, queen takes bishop. If I ever take back the pawn, he still has this bishop takes c6. My king's in the center, and that... I might be better, but in this kind of a time control, when I've only got four minutes left, why, why bother with that? So knight d7, queen c2, c6, takes, takes. And here I thought I was just better. I mean, obviously, my goal is to castle and put my queen on e4, maybe trade and get my rook on e4, and then just put a lot of pressure here on d3. Another idea is to play knight f6, knight d4 myself, but then the problem is I do give him 
control of the e5 square my opponent blundered here with knight to e5 and i was just talking about you know if i can play the c5 move i'm fine so maybe whoops maybe this g4 move wasn't such a half half bad idea on his part it's a desperation measure it just seems really weakening so maybe i missed something here i, I played h5 really quickly but maybe that's just too positional let's say if i play f takes g4 he has no threats but at the same time, I don't have another piece to get into the game. I mean, if I play rook to f8 after that, rook takes f8, you know, there's no easy way to develop. If I could play castles, he plays for e4. I don't know. Queen h4. Definitely, definitely more interesting. Let's see if there was a way to maybe win after this. So h5, e4, this is forced. This was his best move, and there's no way. As long if I give him a tempo that's not a check, he can move this bishop, and there's no checkmates at all. So the three move was the only way to go. So let's go back. Whoops, to here. This is the critical position. I just didn't have enough time here. So what if I just castled? The idea of getting my rook active he goes here okay queen to here is forced and my opponent has a decision and i think if he wants to be active this is his only way to play this is the critical line um but rather than taking on h3 or playing queen g3 or worrying about that i can just play takes get an active move there's no there's no worry about a d takes c6 discovered check so this can't be too bad so let's see if i play e takes f5 for white Queen g3, king h1, queen takes h3, king g1, queen takes g4. This is much more promising for me, definitely. d4 is under attack. That's the point I'm going to take because I can bring in my dark squared bishop. So he plays a move like king to h1. I take here. Queen h4 is coming up. Bishop takes e5. Yeah, this is how I win this game. So this is a one game for me. Um, but I just didn't have enough time in the critical position. I guess... The, the key lessons for me here, you know, uh, my, my opening was dubious at best, but I needed more pieces in for this attack. And when I went in for h5, it was just too quick. Here, what do you want from me? When I went for this h5 idea, it was just too quick. You know, you, e4, and then I, I don't even have f4. This king never got safe during the middle game, and I think that that's what really caused me to not be able to pull out a win. But two and a half out of three, not a bad result. I mean, obviously the first one was more of a gimme. And the second one, the guy resigns prematurely. But um, two and a half out of three against you know fairly rated people, whatever. Um, and I, you know, hopefully I'll be back with more live chess videos. Um, so if there's one lesson maybe for that you can pick up from these three games, it's definitely about the outpost. Always be looking for them, uh, and they can definitely create a bind. You know, they they you know they were a big factor, obviously, in my first two games. And in this game, you know, it was a little bit interesting with the idea of ninety four. Maybe I carried away a little bit. Um, I'll have to look at that myself. But um, nonetheless, fun games. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed this video. This is Isaac Steinkamp signing off with the Chess Summit Network. And I hope you have a great summer.